In this video I'll discuss and demonstrate a single board computer I've built called the TS2. I've covered this in more detail in a series of blog posts, but I thought a video would be a better way to demonstrate the system in operation. At the end I'll give links to the blog and the GitHub projects for the hardware design and software. I'm interested in retro computing, having built a number of kits like the Brielle Replica 1, Altair 8800, and Superboard 3, and owning some old computers like a Kim 1 and Timex Sinclair 2000. For the Replica 1, I designed and built some hardware, including a ROM RAM add-on board. In the back of my mind, I've been looking for a more ambitious hardware project. Having worked with some 8-bit CPUs like the 6502 and 8080, I was also interested in something more powerful like the Motorola 68000. Last year I picked up this book on the 68000 called Microprocessor Systems Design 68000 Hardware, Software and Interfacing by Alan Clements. This is one of the classic books on the 68000 series of chips covering both the software and hardware aspects. Chapter 11 describes the design of a complete 68000 based single board computer, the TS2, which was developed and used at the University of Teesside in the 1990s for teaching students microprocessor hardware and software. The book outlines all of the design, although it doesn't show the board layout or even any photographs of the system. It occurred to me that it should be feasible to build the board based on the information contained in the book. The design has a number of nice features and advantages. It's a self-contained computer with ROM, RAM, and serial ports. It uses discrete parts with no PALs or other programmable devices. The book includes a small machine language monitor program for the board. It's compatible with the Motorola Educational Computer Board, or ECB, which was widely used for learning. It's a design which has actually been implemented, proven, and used. The theory of operation is well covered in the book and relatively easy to understand. So trying to replicate the board looked feasible, but I anticipated a few risks and challenges. There could be errors in the published schematic, since it was hand-drawn for publication in the book. Some parts might be hard to obtain, as they're no longer being manufactured. There were no pictures of the board in the book or that I could find on the internet, so I would have to come up with a board layout myself. An initial investigation indicated that I should be able to obtain all the parts as new or new old stock. I decided to use wire wrap as the construction method since it's suitable for a one-off board like this and makes it easy to change the circuit as it's being developed and debugged. To reduce the risk of there being errors in the published circuit, I decided to enter the schematic in the free KiCad computer-aided design program. This helped verify the design and makes it easy to modify and print out. I did find a few small errors and I had to resolve some issues like circuitry that was duplicated on different pages in order to make the design clearer in the textbook. I made a few changes to the design to accommodate my goals. This is covered in more detail in my blog, but essentially I removed the circuitry for the external backplane expansion bus and I simplified the serial port circuitry to use FTDI USB to serial adapters. This removed the need for plus and minus 12 volt power supplies. I also added more interrupt support circuitry. I avoided any other changes that would use more modern parts as I wanted to keep this as a retro design that used parts from the original era when it was designed. The basic specifications of the board are the following. An 8 MHz 68000 microprocessor, power on and push button reset, and an LED indicating halt or reset condition, 32 kilobytes of EEPROM or EEPROM, 32 kilobytes of static RAM, two serial ports to support connection to a terminal and a host computer, switches and circuitry for single stepping one machine cycle at a time, interrupt encoding and acknowledge circuitry for eight levels of interrupts with level seven connected to an abort switch, monitor software in ROM that supports downloading, running, and debugging programs. As described in my blog, I brought the board up in stages, first prototyping the clock and reset circuitry, then getting the CPU to free run, first on a breadboard, then on the wire wrap board. Then I moved to implementing the full address decoding circuitry in ROM and RAM and got the board up and running. This was the most complex step as it involved many parts. After that I added the serial ports and interrupt circuitry. The unit was built on a 6 by 9 inch perf board with a grid of 0.1 inch spaced holes. The majority of parts are installed on wire wrap sockets with some discrete parts mounted directly on the board. I added feet using nylon standoffs to prevent the board from having to sit on the wire wrap socket pins and mounted a piece of plexiglass on top to provide some protection from dust and dropping things on the board. 
I manually came up with a board layout to attempt to minimize the length of wiring by keeping related chips near each other. I also grouped similarly sized chips together. At the top are two banana jacks for 5 volt power. It requires regulated 5 volts at about 600 milliamps of current. You can also power it from USB, which is generally more convenient than an external power supply. A large 100 microfarad capacitor provides power supply filtering. A 0.1 microfarad capacitor is across each IC's power pins following standard TTL design practice. The large 64 pin dip chip is obviously the 68000 microprocessor. It's an 8 MHz version in a plastic package. 64 pin wire wrap sockets are hard to find so I cut some 40 pin sockets. The 28 pin devices around the CPU are RAM and ROM. The upper four are the 32K of RAM and the lower four provide 32K of ROM. The ROM can be ultraviolet erasable EEPROMs or electrically erasable EEPROMs. I'll describe later the contents of the ROMs. The three large chips along the lower right are the two serial ports using Motorola 6850 UART chips and the baud rate generator chip which uses the crystal. There are two six pin headers which connect to off the shelf FTDI USB to serial adapters. This was a change from the original design to allow connecting the serial ports directly to a computer's USB ports, avoiding the need for a real serial port on the host computer and the need for RS-232 line driver and receiver circuitry on this TS2 board. There are also jumpers for each USB port. If you want to power the unit from USB, you connect the jumper for the corresponding port. The smaller DIP chips are mostly glue logic. This includes all of the address decoding, reset circuitry, DTAC timing, and the single step support. This is the 8 MHz clock oscillator, and this 555 timer is used for the power on reset circuitry. Some discrete components are mounted on sockets. I use SIP resistors for pull-ups to reduce the number of components needed. These dip switches select the timing of the acknowledge signal for the RAM and ROM and can be adjusted for the speed of the memory devices used. The interrupt circuitry was added later in the design and the chips were placed along the top right where there was some space remaining. The controls are at the front. If the unit was built into a case, they would probably be mounted there instead. The controls are the following from right to left. The abort switch generates a level 7 interrupt, which is non-maskable. The monitor ROM uses this to allow running program to be interrupted. This was not part of the original TS2 design, but I added it as it's useful and was present on the similar Motorola ECB board. The green LED indicates power as controlled by the on-off switch next to it. The red LED indicates a reset or halt condition. On power on or push button reset, it lights. If the CPU halts, such as due to an error, the LED lights indicate a halted state. The push button performs a reset. This toggle switch controls the single step mode. In the run position, the CPU runs normally. In the step position, the CPU executes one bus cycle, not one instruction, each time the step push button is pressed. The single step mode is useful for hardware level debugging. You can switch in and out of step mode at any time. I actually found this feature was not as useful as I initially thought it would be once the board was up and running. For one thing, it runs very slowly, only one bus cycle at a time, so running code is very slow. You also typically need test equipment like a logic analyzer attached to the system to understand what it's doing. All wiring's on the bottom, most of which is wire wrapped. Typical of wire wrapping, it looks like something of a rat's nest, but it's actually quite reliable and permanent when done correctly. I ran large power and ground wires around the edges of the board to small pads of PCB material. The power and grounds for each chip are picked off from these. I use color coding of wire wrap wires to distinguish between power, ground, data lines, address lines, and control lines, at least until I ran out of some colors of wire. Wire wrapping used Kynar wire, available cheaply on eBay, and a small hand wire wrapping and stripping tool which I've had for years. The wire wrapping was quite labor intensive and tedious but made it easy to make changes or correct wiring errors. I carefully checked all connections against the schematic using a DMM in continuity mode as it's easy to make wiring mistakes with the board inverted. To run the board you hook it up to either external 5 volt power or use a USB port for power. Connect the terminal port to a computer's USB port where it shows up as a USB serial device. Run a terminal emulator program on the attached computer. On Linux, Minicom is a popular choice. You can also optionally connect the second USB serial port to a computer, but can generally get by with just one port. 
Two serial ports made more sense in the days of using dumb terminals and mainframe host computers for software development. You'll typically communicate with the board using a monitor program in ROM, which I'll describe next. The original T-Side TS2 computer included a small machine language monitor program called TS2Mon or TSBug. There's a source listing for it in the book as well as the included CD-ROM. I programmed it into two ROMs and got it running on the board. It's a very rudimentary monitor program and is a little over three kilobytes in size. The monitor provides 12 commands offering some basic features. Examining and changing memory, displaying and changing registers, starting program execution, loading and saving memory through the serial port using Motorola hex or S record format, basic support for breakpoints allowing the setting and clearing of breakpoints and program execution to be halted and continued after breakpoint. I've documented the commands on my GitHub account where the code can also be found. Here's a sample session showing some of the commands. So we can display memory using the mem command specifying an address. It displays the current value at that hex address as a word. We can hit any key like N to advance to the next address. We can hit minus to go to the previous address. We can hit space and type in a new value. And go back and see the new values and hit enter to exit. We can display registers with the disp command. And we can change the value of registers using the reg command. We'll change a couple here. Let's change the program counter to 1000. Let's change D0 We can also dump a range of memory to an S record file by using the dump command and specifying the start and end addresses. The output actually goes to the second serial port so we don't see it here through the terminal emulator. The monitor code was designed to be simple and readable. Despite its simplicity, it does have a few more advanced features. It uses what are called device control blocks, or DCBs, in RAM to allow modifying the device input-output routines to redirect them. It can also be extended by code in a second set of ROMs to add more commands. When the 68000 chip was introduced, Motorola offered the MEX68K ECB Educational Computer Board. It included a monitor program called Tutor. I remember briefly having access to one where I worked back in the mid-1980s when some products were moving to this new processor and staff was becoming familiar with it. The T-Side TS2, while similar, is a simpler board design using static rather than dynamic RAM and lacks some features of the ECB like the parallel port and timer and cassette tape interface. The TS2 was designed to be compatible with the ECB in terms of the memory map for ROM and RAM and serial ports. This allows it to run the Tutor monitor program. I was able to find source and binary code for the Tutor software and cross-compile it on Linux. It's 16 kilobytes in size and will fit in the first two 8K EEPROMs of the TS2. The Tutor monitor is well documented in Chapter 3 of the M68000 Educational Computer Board User's Manual, which you can find on the internet. It's quite sophisticated, even including a disassembler and assembler. I'll just cover a few highlights and examples of what it offers. Overall, it provides the following features. Display and modification of memory as byte, word, long word, string, character, or disassembled instructions. Display and modification of registers. Memory fill, move, search, and test functions. Number conversion between decimal and hexadecimal. The ability to set and clear breakpoints. And the ability to run programs with breakpoints or line-by-line -line tracing. And output to either of two serial ports, a parallel printer port, or cassette tape. The latter two don't exist on the TS2 computer. Saving and loading a memory in S record format and an assembler which allows entering assembly language mnemonics. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, the most basic command is help or HE which displays the available commands. Uh, let's look at displaying memory first in hex and ASCII. So the command MD is memory display. 
we can look at memory starting at address 8008 for a length of 80 hex bytes. And we can see some of the ROM displayed in hex in ASCII. We could also disassemble that with the same command by adding the DI or disassemble option. And we can see a machine language disassembly. Now it also includes quite a powerful assembler that's mostly compatible with Motorola's cross assembler, but it lacks features like editing, line numbers, and labels. So let's look at an example of that. We'll use that with the memory modify command and we'll start our little program at address 4000 and we'll specify the DI or disassemble option so that we can enter assembly language. We need to prefix each line with a space because it doesn't support labels. So we'll enter just a little three line machine language program. We'll start with a instruction to clear the D0 register. Clear it out long D0 and add quick immediate one to D0 and then we'll do a jump to address 4002, the instruction above to go back and keep incrementing. Uh, dot will exit. If we want we can disassemble this just to confirm that we entered it properly with a memory display in the DI option. So if we want we can now run or single step our program. So we can do that by setting the program counter the start address 4000 with the PC command. And if we want to check the values of the registers that we use, DF display formatted will display the values of all the registers. So we see the program counter set to 4000. And the first instruction that's going to be executed is that clear instruction. So if we hit T for trace, we can trace a uh, single instruction, execute the instruction, come back to the monitor. Now we can look at the registers and see that D0 was indeed cleared and set to all zeros. And the next instruction is the add. And we can hit T or we can just hit enter now that we're in trace mode and execute the next instruction. And sure enough, we can see that D0 has now been incremented to 1. And the next instruction is a jump going back to address 4002. We could trace that again. If we want, we can trace multiple instructions. So we could trace for, say, 10 hex or 16 instructions and have it run those one instruction at a time. Now we could also start execution from an address using the go command. So we could start execution from address 4000 and run our program at full speed. So our little program is going to be an endless loop, just incrementing a register and isn't going to stop. So we can interrupt it by hitting the level 7 abort switch. And that will jump into the monitor and show us what the current value of all the registers was. So we can see that it was indeed in still inside our little program, uh, doing incrementing and jumping, and we can see what the value of D0 had reached. So using Tutor, I could cross-compile code on a Linux laptop, generate a Motorola hex file, and then I could transfer it to the monitor onto the TS2 over the serial port. In a pinch, if you cannot afford a development system with a cross-compiler, you could use Tutor's assembler for development and upload the disassembled source and assembled S record file. Overall, I see little reason to use the TS2 monitor as Tutor is much more powerful. The features like breakpoints, tracing, and the disassembler make it much easier to debug test programs. The Tutor monitor is quite powerful, but a high level language makes programming much easier. In the 1980s, the standard programming language for home computers was BASIC. One of the options for BASIC on the 68000 is Enhanced BASIC. Written by Lee Davison, Enhanced BASIC is a BASIC interpreter that he wrote from scratch for both the 6502 and 68000 processors. It's designed to be easy to port to different systems, and it's free for non-commercial use. I earlier looked at Enhanced BASIC on my 6502-based Brielle Replica 1 computer. The 68000 version looked interesting and feasible to port to the TS2. To port it to the TS2, I only needed to write routines for character input and output. I wrote them to talk directly to the 6850 console UART. I also needed to adjust the addresses to work within the memory map of the TS2. Enhanced BASIC is almost 16K in size and needs at least 16K of RAM for programs. The TS2 has 32K, so it was just enough for it to run out of RAM. It took about 30 seconds to download the S record file over the serial port at 9600 bits per second. Once I got it working from RAM, I then assembled it to run out of ROM. 
The enhanced basic conveniently fits in the second pair of 16K ROM with Tudor in the first 16K. Running from ROM, it can now use all of the RAM. About 23K is available to basic programs when it starts up. Here's a sample session starting from reset into the Tudor monitor. So I'll enter a little basic uh, loop program just to show the flavor for how it works. And I'll change the print statement to show some of the more advanced features that we can read memory with a peak function and we can display it as hex. So here's our new program and running it we can see some of the memory locations displayed in hex. Enhanced Basic has floating point and integer variables and it has over a hundred keywords. It includes advanced features like conversion to hexadecimal and binary and keywords have to be in uppercase. It's not totally compatible with other basics so you'll typically need to port programs to it. I tried the classic Hammurabi program that was in a book published by Creative Computing and found that it worked without changes, although there were some formatting issues in the output due to differences in the way the print command functions. Here's a sample. There are some other basic implementations that will run on the board like Tiny Basic and some other languages like Forth. You can also cross-assemble and cross-compile assembly language C and C++ programs. I've covered some of these on my blog. I've made some notes on some possible circuit changes in what I'm calling a revision 2.1. A few of the parts can be difficult to source. I'm planning to replace the need for the hard to attain 25L is 2548 with some more common chips. It could also use a simpler baud rate generator circuit with a more readily available part than the obsolete Motorola MC14411. Since the design is in a CAD program, I've been experimenting with a printed circuit board layout using KiCad. I'm still learning how to use the program, but it will show up on GitHub as the work progresses. I wonder if there'd be interest in offering a printed circuit board and maybe a kit of parts. A number of real operating systems can run on the 68000, including a version of Linux, but this would require at least one megabyte or more of RAM, so it would require a design with more memory. During the course of this project, I learned a lot about hardware and KiCad. When I started it, I didn't know if I would actually see the board up and running. It's very rewarding to build a board from scratch and see it come to life, even if it's technology that's a few decades old. I hope you enjoyed this look at some retro computing hardware. If so, you may be interested in some of my other YouTube videos.